Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our action-packed one-hour workshop today on buyer agency agreements. Um, I'm your moderator, Caroline Wilkins. Uh, we are so happy to have all of you here today. I'm going to do some quick introductions, and then we are going to get right in because we have a lot to cover, and we only have an hour to do it. So um, joining me today is Steve Scholl and Lori Gilmore. Steve is the founder and CEO of Performance Coaching and has been coaching agents for over 30 years. So as a result of putting in over 60,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching, this has led Steve to develop a really unique approach that takes fear and the fight out of real estate, allowing all of you to build stronger businesses while actually enjoying your lives. Because why does it matter if we're not enjoying every day? And joining Steve is the incredible Lori Gilmore. Lori is a practicing agent in New York City and has been a coaching client of Steve's since 2017 and is now one of our uh, coaches at Performance Coaching. It's become a passion of Lori's that you all will really see during today's workshop to help other agents achieve a productive and peaceful professional life. It is possible because she has done it. She's really passionate about professional standards in her business and has exclusive agreements with all of her buyers. So we're so excited to have Lori join Steve today to talk about this really, really important topic and share with you all how she does it. So Lori, over to you. Okay. Good afternoon, class. We are here to talk about exclusive buyer representation agreements. As Caroline said, we have so much to cover in this hour. It's going to be tight. So put those thoughts in the chat. At the end, we'll get to as many questions as we can, but we'll hold them for the end. Also, to keep us on track and on time, I'm going to be reading from my notes, so forgive the wandering eyeballs. All right, so exclusive buyer representation agreements. How are we gonna tackle this from the inside out? Because our goal here at Performance Coaching is so much bigger than how to execute paperwork. These are the goals. Setting your own standards, elevating your professionalism, thereby elevating the profession as a whole, becoming a trusted advisor, working only in exclusive relationships, and establishing a repeat and referral business. All of those goals are intertwined, and together they result in enjoying your work and feeling valued by your clients. And here are the tools with which to achieve those goals. Exclusive buyer representation agreements. Notice the emphasis on exclusive. We'll come back to that. And your CRM. We'll talk about the process of how to utilize those tools and achieve those goals when working with existing buyers and new buyers, both referrals and leads. And we'll talk just a little bit about how this agreement impacts your conversations with sellers. We'll look at the obstacles you're facing, common objections from potential clients and fears, most notably your own fears. And we'll cover some concepts which will help you work through those fears and objections, utilize your tools and achieve those goals. We're gonna talk about tactical empathy a lot, in particular, the favorite or the fool concept. And we're also gonna introduce a three-step framework for interviewing potential new clients. Is there a deal here? Is there a deal here for me? Do I want this deal? Important, you'll see why. And we're gonna move back and forth between the concepts, tools, obstacles, and processes because they all interact together in terms of achieving the goals. But first, I'm gonna sermonize a bit as to why this moment in our industry is so pivotal and such a golden opportunity in which to achieve those lofty goals. The buyer representation agreement is exactly the solution to the problem you didn't even know you had. Personally, I have always taken issue with the idea that very many people in this business have, which is that listing agents are the better agents. They're more skilled, experienced, professional agents. It is not inherently true. It doesn't have to be true. But this belief comes in part from the way in which many agents conduct themselves when working with buyers. And that's not necessarily coming from any nefarious or unethical intent. It is the natural outcome when agents are not working on an exclusive basis. When you're not working in exclusive 
trusting relationships, your fear of losing a deal is going to drive your behavior, at least to some extent, in on, if only subconsciously, because you're human and humans are driven by fear. Without that exclusive relationship, you find yourself in positions of chasing, convincing, pushing. You find yourself running out with strangers at the drop of a hat, spending valuable time working with buyers who aren't really buying, and being treated like a commodity by your customers. It's stressful, it's counterproductive, and it's not a good look. And now we are being given the ultimate opportunity to work at the same professional level with buyers as we have always done with our sellers, working with an exclusive agreement, formalizing our fiduciary duty to our buyers, our exclusive relationship, and our right to be paid for our services, just as we've always done with sellers. This is elevating our standards of professionalism, and this will ultimately lead us to enjoying a much less stressful and much more rewarding life by working as a trusted advisor to our clients rather than a commodity for our customers. And side benefit, when we each elevate our standards of professionalism, that elevates the profession as a whole. And we can use a bit of that, clearly. Real estate agents have a perception problem. The disdain for what we do is palpable in almost every article you read. So every step toward a more professional way of doing business is a step in the right direction for all of us. There is good reason to be excited about the changes happening in our industry. If you've been coaching with Steve for a while, you've been on these calls, you have the benefit of having been deep in these conversations for many months, over which time we've gone from fear to acceptance to excitement together. And others I know are just starting to wrap their minds around this change since things became a little more real a few weeks ago. And you're probably understandably still in fear mode. What we share here today, we hope, will get you more comfortable and maybe even enthusiastic. I do want to share a couple of disclaimers up front. Be clear that I am not an attorney, not your manager. We all work in different markets. If you have questions regarding the proper administrative implementation, implementation of buyer agreements in your market, check with your manager, please. Some markets have new exclusive agreements already. Some do not. If you leave here with concerns about specific wording and commission conversations, verify your verbiage with your legal department or your manager. And until the NAR settlement is approved by a judge and the changes are officially implemented, there are still some areas where we are all interpreting the settlement documents. So for the purposes of this class, we're working from our current suppositions and our beliefs. You verify your own truth. Okay, Steve. Let's bring you in. Would you mind giving your perspective here to orient people? We're probably speaking with a bunch of agents who have not been on your calls before and not are not familiar with your particular way of coaching. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, when it when it comes to this topic, you know, there's all these different trainings going on right now. You're probably sick to death hearing about you know, another training on the buyer representation agreement. And what you're getting is the whole idea that in order to get this agreement signed, you need to be able to articulate your value. And getting this agreement signed has nothing to do with being able to articulate your value. It's about demonstrating your understanding of what the client is going through and what the client is thinking and feeling. So this is not going to be about demonstrating your value. You're going to hear a lot about tactical empathy. And tactical empathy is the skill and ability to make people feel understood, to articulate what they're thinking and feeling without necessarily agreeing or disagreeing. Again, it's recognizing their situation and circumstance, recognizing who they are and making them feel understood. 
So I encourage you, you're going to hear some different thoughts today. Keep your mind open. And at the end, you can judge whether this has value to you or not. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. Next time we invite you to speak, please swing that mic in. People have got a lot of complaints about your mic right now. All right. So Steve mentioned the concept of tactical empathy, and this will be referenced throughout this call. It's the foundation. And if you're new to this coaching, like Steve said, it probably is going to sound kind of weird. It's, and I'm going to give you just a three-minute overview of tactical empathy so you might feel a little less like you're listening to a foreign language. Because tactical empathy is the skill that will make you a trusted advisor to your clients. Mastering this skill as a real estate agent is the single most effective way to put a stop to the endless cycle of chasing deals, convincing clients, and being treated like a commodity, and to graduate to running a highly professional repeat and referral business based in trusting relationships and mutual respect. Tactical empathy is most simply an approach centered around collaboration and empathy rather than aggressive negotiation tactics. It's the strategic and skillful use of empathy in communication in order to gain understanding of another person's perspective, build rapport, and gain trust. And emotional intelligence is all about perceiving, understanding, and appropriately managing emotions, your own and those of others. And those two things go hand in hand to help you connect with your client or your prospective client in a way that feels valuable to them. You meet them where they are by being genuinely interested in what drives their decision making, being genuinely curious about what their concerns are and seeking those concerns out rather than hoping they don't surface or even worse, dismissing them or sugaring, sugarcoating them when they do. The overriding goal is making people feel understood. And there are a few tools of communication that'll help you get there. There's mirroring. It's repeating the last few words someone has said. It shows that you're actively listening. listening. It prompts the other person to clarify and go into more detail and maybe even correct what they first said. The more they say, the better you can truly understand their perspective. There's labeling. These are sounds like or seems like statements. Sounds like you're looking for X or seems like you're concerned about Y and Z. These are verbal observations that, again, let people know you are deeply listening and paying attention. And there's the accusations audit. And this is where you call out people's negative thoughts and emotions. You're probably really disappointed. You are going to hate what I have to say right now. By calling out the negative emotions, you're acknowledging them and diffusing them. And you're not going to create negative emotions where they don't exist. You're actually inoculating against them. And this one probably makes you really uncomfortable. You're probably rolling your eyes right now. People tend to really push back on this one when they're first learning. It takes time to get used to it, and it takes some guts, but it does work. And there are no oriented questions. So we're all in real estate and we've all been trained to go for the yes, right? But people feel more in control. They feel more comfortable saying no. And that builds trust. Builds trust. So reframe your question rather than, are you ready to submit the offer now? Flip it to, would you be uncomfortable submitting the offer today? The no they give you there is a positive result but they feel more in control than they would if they had delivered a yes to you. No oriented questions invite honest responses, foster open communication, and help to identify hidden concerns. And that is a very, very basic overview of a communication skill that can take years of work to master. But if you implement any of these tools starting right now, you will see immediate results, I promise, and you can tell me all about them. And we will put some links to resources in the chat for you so you can do more reading and research on tactical empathy if you're interested. So at this point, you might be getting antsy. You come to a class on buyer representation agreements. We're, I don't know, 15 minutes in and no one's telling you how to get the paper signed. I will say a little bit about the actual documents now, which is 
as these changes begin to be implemented and these documents start to become available throughout all brokerages and all markets, you will be offered a couple of choices. You'll have the exclusive buyer representation agreement and the non-exclusive buyer representation agreement. And be very clear, those choices are not equivalent. The non-exclusive buyer representation agreement is paperwork. The exclusive buyer representation agreement is a relationship. And you should, should certainly be familiar with both. There are moments when the non-exclusive agreement will be a viable tool, most notably as an interim step when you're working with colder leads on your way to the exclusive agreement. For example, if you're dealing with something like Zillow leads and you're required to accommodate the buyer's request for a specific viewing right away, you can get the non-exclusive buyer representation agreement signed indicating that one property, and then you have a larger conversation with them about exclusivity, and we'll talk more about that. Our point here in this class is about getting to exclusive trusted advisor client relationships and to putting an end to running around with buyers who view you as a commodity and have no interest in committing to you. So here we'll bring Steve in again to talk about a key concept which allows us to discover in the shortest amount of time possible whether or not a potential client views us as a trusted advisor or a commodity. Steve, please give us three minutes on the favorite or the fool. The entire real estate industry is built on a false premise. All of you think you win or lose business based on your, based on your ability to articulate your value and convince people to work with you. Fact, logic, and reason. By the time you get a phone call, that call that all of you want. We're thinking about selling our home and we'd love for you to come out and talk to us. When you get that phone call, they already know who they wanna work with or they're leaning strongly in a direction. And we call this the favorite and the fool. And within 15 minutes, and Lori will be getting into this, within 15 minutes or so, you can find out from any potential seller or buyer whether you're the favorite or you're the fool. And when you're the favorite, then you're going to move forward with someone. When you're the fool in the game, the goal is not to convince them. The goal is to exit gracefully. And so... The coaching we do is all about reading the situation so you can determine who are you. Are you the favorite or the fool? And this is what Lori is going to get into today. And when you're the favorite, they're going to pay you whatever your, your fee is. When you're the fool in the game, it doesn't make a difference what your fee is. Lori? Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. And, and that's a great point for us to get ready. We're ready now to get into the conversations in which we introduce the exclusive document to our existing buyers with whom, hopefully, we have already cultivated the trusted advisor relationship. For the purposes of demonstration, I'll share with you the conversation I had with my existing buyers when I presented the exclusive agreement months ago. I was able to have these discussions back in November when Compass first made the document available to us in the city. So these are buyers I had already been working with under a verbal exclusive agreement that we had. We went out to see another property. After the viewing, outside chatting on the sidewalk, I brought it up. I said, so there's one thing to discuss, which might be really irritating. That's tactical empathy. It includes paperwork. So you may have noticed recently a lot of talk about lawsuits against real estate brokerages in the news. All of that has resulted in a push for more transparency in our working relationships. So the first question is, would it be presumptuous of me to assume that going forward, if you choose to purchase in the city, we would be working together on that purchase? Again, that's tactical empathy. That's a no-oriented question. Nope, they said not presumptuous. Great, okay. 
So as part of this push for transparency, I'm updating my process of working with buyers. We now have exclusive buyer representation agreements to sign. The document covers three things. It outlines my fiduciary duty to you. It defines our relationship as one of exclusivity. And it specifies my minimum fee for service, which is 3%. Does any of that sound like a problem? Nope, no problem. I wanted to make sure that they had no problem. So I followed up with a more specific question. Do you have any questions about my fee and how that gets paid? And they said, oh, right, this is about the sellers no longer paying the buyer's fee, right? And I said, that's right. Part of the new industry transparency is a decoupling of the payment of brokerage fees. Historically, sellers signed their listing exclusive stating one fee to be split between the two brokerages on the transaction. Starting this year, sellers will sign their exclu exclusives stating the fee they're paying their listing firm and stating the fee, if any, that they will pay directly to the buyer's brokerage firm. When you're viewing properties, you will always know up front how each seller has structured that payment, whether they're offering to pay some, all, or none of my fee. This document's something I'm sure you'll want to read through carefully. I'll upload it to DocuSign when I get back to the computer, and we can get on the phone if you have any other questions. So for all of the existing buyers I transferred over at that time, the conversations were almost identical. There was no pushback. There were no follow-up questions. They asked me to send the agreement over and they signed it right away, both for a period of one year, both at 3%. One's buying in the million dollar range. The other one's buying in the 12 to $15 million range. All that just to say, it's all possible. And you're probably thinking, that conversation can't be real. That sounds way too simple. It was that simple in very large part because these were buyers with whom I already had established the trusted advisor status. As Steve said, when you are perceived as the trusted advisor to a client, a seller or a buyer, they will commit to you and they will pay your fee. It's that simple. If so, if your business is already solely based on repeat and referral clients, your conversations are gonna flow like this. If you're still working toward establishing a repeat and referral business, this is a great moment for you to prioritize digging into your CRM in order to grow and sustain your existing relationships where you will be able to so naturally become the trusted advisor. And now we have to look at how you do that with new buyers, both referrals and colder leads. And to help with that, Steve is going to introduce another concept which is a huge part in getting us to the trusted advisor stage in as short an amount of time as possible and allowing us to get these agreements signed with the greatest of ease. Steve, please hit us with the three-step framework to use when interviewing potential new buyers and tell us what's going on in those steps. You have a full four minutes. Feels like a game show. So <laughs> as you see on the screen, the framework is simple and straightforward. The first question you have to look at, is there a deal here? And that entails finding out what someone's hopes and dreams are, what their fears are, and how realistic are they in terms of what's going on in the market. And again, this is not you selling. This is not you telling. This is not you explaining. This is not you convincing. This is you finding out, uncovering the truth. What are they thinking? What is their vision for how this process will unfold? And again, are they realistic or not? Is there a deal here for me this is where we get into a concept called proof of life. And again, this comes from Chris Voss and the hostage negotiator universe. And proof of life is simply two words. Why me? Of all the agents you could have reached out to, why me? and you're listening intently to their answer. They're either gonna give you a robust response 
of why they see you as being valuable to them, or they're going to give you a random response, which again is an indicator that you're simply the fool in the game and they're doing due diligence. And once you determine that there's actually a deal, once you determine they do want to work with you, then you've got to ask yourself, do I want to work with them based on my standards? And again, Lori will get into that. All right. You know, you're, am I reclaiming your two minutes? You, you got extra time. You want to talk more about that? You got it. No, you, they're all you're yours. Done. All right. So the content of the conversation about the exclusive document itself will remain basically the same for all prospective clients. What's crucial is the timing as to when you have the conversation. Some level of trust needs to be established before you do so. And that framework is such a great clarifying structure to help you get there. With new buyers, you go through that three-step framework. You determine whether you're the favorite or the fool. You determine whether there's really a deal there. You determine whether or not these people are, are people you want to work with, right? So you go through that framework. You determine whether you're the favorite or the fool. Then you move forward or you exit gracefully. And statistically speaking, of course, you're going to find yourself the favorite much more often in referral situations, and you're likely to be the fool. The more likely to be the fool, the colder the lead is. The amount of work you have to do up front to establish trust is going to depend how removed this person is from you all along that scale from hand-picked personal referral all the way down to the Zillow lead and they didn't know they were calling you. It doesn't mean it can't be done, but that framework will help. And at the end of that framework conversation, if you're moving forward, you segue into the document. Something like, but before we jump into the fun part together, there's some paperwork to execute. There are a couple of required fair housing and agency disclosure forms to sign, and this is new. We now have the exclusive buyer representation agreement. There have been some changes in the industry recently. You may have read a bit about that in about the recent lawsuits. And you continue on, as in the previously shared conversation, covering those main three items that the document covers. Again, those are, it outlines my fiduciary duty to you. It defines our relationship as one of exclusivity. It specifies my minimum fee for service, which is X. And you make sure to seek out any questions they may have. The colder the lead is, the less trust you've established, the more questions you'll face. And we'll get into those common objections in a minute. First, I have some housekeeping points and maybe I'll review some disclaimers with you. So housekeeping, if this were a two hour call, we do some role playing on these conversations. I know we're telling you how to do it and you're imagining how am I actually doing that? Well, I'll take a moment to mention that performance coaching hosts several role play calls each week. Attending those calls and honing your skills through role play will greatly improve your confidence and will accelerate your growth. And they are a great companion piece to this introductory class. This class is just one of many in a community of like-minded agents who not only share your goal, as impossible as this probably sounds, they all support each other as they work to hone their skills and grow their businesses. So welcome in. We'll put a link in the chat so that you can sign up for a 14 day free trial of those calls if you'd like. Also, this call is being recorded. You can listen back. You'll be given access to a link for that as well. And we reference the power of your CRM in terms of growing your repeat and referral business. Well, that is a many hour class in itself. If you need help in that area, and everybody does, performance coaching has classes for you on that as well. Okay, so back to the disclaimers. As I said, any questions, review that with your manager, your legal department. And as far as NAR goes, the suppositions we're using in this class are as follows. Let's assume for timing that you 
need to get a buyer agreement, exclusive or non-exclusive, signed before you enter a property with a buyer every time, every buyer. Commission offers from the seller. Let's assume that they do not appear anywhere in your MLS. So you notice I told my client in my earlier dialogue, you will always know beforehand on each property what the seller is offering as far as a buyer broker commission. Well, I might change that language to, I will always do everything in my power to find out what the seller is offering before we step inside, because we don't know where it will be, if it will be indicated anywhere. We're not going to spend our time speculating. You'll do what you have to do in the end. If that means picking up the phone to call each one of the listing agents before the viewing, then great. You're building stronger relationships with your colleagues. And about your fee on the agreement. I'm going to break the internet with this one. We're going to assume that your compensation is limited to the fee that is listed on the buyer representation agreement, meaning you cannot collect more even if the seller is offering more. That is a potential outcome. It's still unclear. We were originally hearing the interpretation that you could set your minimum fee, but receive more if the seller's offering more. Now we're hearing more of the interpretation that based on the NAR settlement documents, they want the buyer's broker agreement to be a set fee. We don't know which way it'll go. Maybe there'll be a way to collect additional incentives. Maybe there's a new development carve out or a new development solution. We don't know. And I'm sure there's many strong opinions in the chat right now, but let's prepare for the worst with the potential of being pleasantly surprised. So that means, long story short, think long and hard about what you want your standard commission to be. And then check with your manager about, manager about what you can say and what you can do. All right, that's enough for me of me for at least a few minutes. Steve, I'm sure that everyone is chomping at the bit to go over their fears about this process and really dig into some common objections. But before we do that, could you please set the stage by speaking to us about how fear is driving our behavior? You have three minutes. Or four, five, take it. One of the things that Chris Foss loves to say is ignore the human condition at your own peril. And we all have to realize that the way we're wired right now, the way we're wired right now, fear is running our life. And just look at this NAR announcement. Most every agent interpreted this announcement in some negative way that I would be losing something. There are very few agents who look at this as an opportunity to get a pay raise, which it actually is. And in life, opportunities are often disguised as obstacles. And as Ryan Holiday wrote, the obstacle is the way. And so it's natural for most people to come from a place of fear. Over the last couple of weeks, I've had clients get on the phone and try and convince me how much business they're going to lose based on this new announcement from NAR. So it's important for all of you to realize that fear is running your life. And unless you're working on your mindset every day to rewire the way you think and the way you show up in life, fear is going to run your life. The same thing is true for your clients. Ultimately, they're making their decisions based on fear of loss, not the prospect of gain. And that's why this idea of going out and pitching your value and throwing fact, logic, and reason at people as to why they should work with you, that's not where you want to go at all because that's not how we make decisions as human beings. So one of the most important things when you're sitting down with a prospect or client is identifying what is their big fear. And we are, we're all afraid of not getting what we want or getting what we don't want. So anytime you're working with either a potential seller or buyer, 
That's one of the things that you have to uncover. What are you most afraid of in this transaction? What is the thing that you don't want to have happen? What is the thing that you don't want? And so be aware, people don't respond to the prospect of gain nearly as much as they respond to fear of loss. Brilliant. And that's my favorite topic. Absolutely favorite. If you can understand someone's fears and you can get your own fears out of the way, this is how you connect with people in a way that is just unstoppable as far as your value is considered, your real value. Okay. So now for some common objections in dealing with the exclusive buyer representation agreement, there are only two kinds of objections. There's commitment and there's fee. Remember the document covers three things. Your fiduciary duty to the buyer. Who's gonna push back on that? That's pretty great. And the relationship of exclusivity and your fee for service. So if you encounter pushback, it's gonna be in one of those two last categories. I'm gonna to speak to the commitment concern. So even before having access to this document, actually from day one in my business, I chose only to work on an exclusive basis with buyers. So my buyers and I always had the exclusivity conversation up front in our first conversation, and we made a verbal commitment to each other. I've had buyers who brought up the fact in that first conversation that they knew several agents and they weren't sure they wanted to commit to just one. And here's what I say in that case. It sounds like you've got a lot of choices. You may not be ready to commit in that way at this time. This might sound really harsh, but it's not possible to run my business successfully unless I'm working only with clients who are committed to me as I am to them. And then you get an answer. I mean, I've had this experience with one of the existing buyers I mentioned earlier, and their answer to that was, no, no, of course, that makes perfect sense. Let's do this. And they committed. And I've had the opposite answer as well, of course. I've had buyers who said, right, let me think about that. We might look around a bit on our own first. And I said, okay. And once you've done some of that, would you be opposed to reaching back out to me if you find that you would like to commit to a trusted advisor? Some of those buyers have come back to me and a couple others have not, and that's okay. An essential piece here is getting past the fear of loss Steve talked about. If you let go of working with buyers who don't want to commit to you, you'll have more time and more energy to grow and deepen the relationships with the client who view clients who view you as a trusted advisor. And that will lead to more referrals and repeat business. So Steve, I think it's time to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the fee. So I'm gonna set you loose on that one, Steve. Would you deal with the pushback on the, on the fee? Would you give us some language on that one? Well, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. What you're determining, whether you're, again, talking to a seller or a buyer, are you the favorite or are you the fool in the game? And when you're the favorite, they're going to pay you whatever your fee is. Now, they may push back once. They may push back twice. However, all they're really doing is fishing. They're fishing to find out, you know, will you bend at all? They don't want to leave any money on the table. And when you're the favorite, you simply say, this is my standard. This is the fee I charge everyone, period. And that's enough. When you're the fool in the game and they challenge you on commission, they're going to try and make you wrong. Again, they're no longer fishing. They're trying to make you wrong. And there's a difference. And in our coaching, you will learn to read that difference. 
And when you're the fool in the game, again, it doesn't make a difference what your fee is. It's not about your fee. And so they're going to say things like, well, all the other agents, they say they do the same things you do, and yet they're willing to work for less or some version of that. Again, they're trying to make you wrong. So the big thing, and again, this is where our coaching is very different. It's all about uncovering the truth. Am I the favorite or am I the fool in the game? When I'm the favorite, they're going to pay me my fee. Again, they may push back once. They may push back twice. However, they're going to pay it. When I'm the fool in the game, it doesn't matter because I am just simply going to exit gracefully. This is the thing that agents really st struggle with. Well, how can I turn them? How can I convince them? How can I get them to work with me? That's not what we're doing here. We're walking away from those people. And yes, you may have a shot. However, it's less than 20%. And that is a low probability activity that I'm not going to engage in. Lori? All right, Steve. Thank you. And that is a very good segue into a short blurb about how you may want to address this change with sellers. And here's some potential language to address the new commission format on sales exclusive, very similar to the buyer conversation. And I know, again, you don't all have the same exclusives, but here's, here's how we do it with the ex new exclusives we have. So you may have noticed recently a lot of talk about lawsuits against real estate brokerages in the news. All of that has resulted in a push for more transparency in our working relationships. Part of the shift is a decoupling of the payment of brokerage fees. Historically, sellers signed their listing exclusive stating one fee to be split between the two brokerages on the transaction. Starting this year, sellers will sign their exclusive stating the fee they're paying their listing firm and stating the fee, if any, they will pay directly to the buyer's brokerage firm. And then you present your commission. And remember, when we're discussing commission now, we're moving away from saying my fee is X total percent, like six, and mo moving to my fee is 3% or whatever it is. And you have a decision to make as to what, if anything, you'd like to offer the buyer's broker. So again, my fee is X. And you have a decision to make as to what, if anything, you'd like to offer the buyer's broker. And you shut up and you let them respond. Whatever their response is, our job is to lay out the landscape for them, but we're not telling them what to do. If they want our opinion, we can pose the idea of what obstacles, what negotiations they may expect to face if they're offering a low commission or no commission. You can tell. Let, let me let me jump it. in real quick, Lori. Do it. Do it. Uh, I did a call earlier today around this dialogue, presenting fee to a seller, and we'll send that out in addition to this call and just walks you right through what that specific dialogue sounds like. Perfect. Yes. Good. Good companion piece. You know, you can tell them what their competition is currently offering. And you can pose the question as to whether or not they think that offering less or more than their competition might have an effect on their sale. You get them thinking, then it's their choice. And the call Steve references goes into more, more detail. You know, it's again, this, if this were a two hour class, we could do all of these dialogues. Again, you've got resources to come to these role play classes. There's just no end to the resources and the, the depth to which you can go into this work. So at this point, Steve, what do you say we open up for questions, comments, and concerns for the next 10 minutes? Caroline, you've been reading the uh I have. We've group. surprisingly had a somewhat quiet group, which uh which is shocking. Um, so again, reminder, if you have any questions, thoughts for Steve and Lori, this is your time. What a treat to have all of this amazing information, Lori, from you today. So um, let's do this one from Heather. So curious how you would respond to the buyer's exclusivity objection with the question or request that you only represent them on any home they are interested in. And instead of other buyers and sellers, you may also be representing on that same home. 
let me let me jump in first and then Lori, you can handle that. This goes back to the framework we presented. Is there a deal here? Is there a deal here with me? Do I want this deal? And all of you have to decide what is your standard? What we coach to is only working with buyers in an exclusive relationship. So if they only wanted to work with you on certain properties, they would fail number three in the framework. Do I want this deal? Because they wouldn't, you know, their standards would be different from yours. Lori, how would you handle that? Right. Again, it is about establishing your standards, which is another wonderful piece of elevating your professionalism, establishing your standards, whatever those are. Mine are that I only work exclusively um, with people. If you're, if you're open to working with them in a non-exclusive basis, um, you're going to have to develop your own language unless I didn't understand the question correctly. So, um, and Lauren, uh, see uh, I uh, let me, let me jump back in. So it sounds like, you know, again, this to Heather, you'd be saying your bar. So it sounds like you don't want to commit to working with one agent. It sounds like it's Steve, that's, it's that's, that's not the question. The question is, so say there's limited inventory and the buyer wants to make it an offer on a home, but we have other buyers who are also interested in that same home. So the right. buyer doesn't have a problem working with us exclusively, but is wanting us to only represent them exclusively, as opposed to if we had multiple buyers or we were also representing the seller on that home. And you just have to decide what your personal standard is. This, the, this question comes up whether you're going to be showing one property to several different buyers and there's no right or wrong answer, Heather, that's, that's a decision you need to make. And if the decision is you are going to show that property to multiple people, then you got to share that up front. You got to let them know that this might be a potential deal breaker. You know, I do have other buyers that are looking at similar properties. And I will be showing this property to, I, I could potentially be showing this property to multiple people. Is that going to be a problem? So you have to be upfront about it. There's not a right or wrong answer. And that's up to you. Does that address okay. your question? Yes. Yes, it does. It, it does. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. A really good question. And Steve, I'm going to pose this one to you and Lori, give you a break. So Steve from George. What are some tips on how to unlearn old training and habits and switch to using tactical empathy strategies? How do you unwire years of doing things a certain way? Well, you're going to hate my answer. And it's going to sound incredibly self-serving. However, you're not going to do this on your own. You're not. And that's what our coaching is all about. It's that's what we're doing every day, unlearning all these bad habits. And you've got to work on it every day and you've got to get feedback every day. You can't sit on the sidelines. And that's why, as Lori mentioned earlier, we do two live role play calls every day. One at 2.30 uh, Pacific time, 5.30 Eastern time, and then again at 5.30 Pacific time. And we call it the hot seat and people get on the hot seat and have to actually get their reps in practice. So again, George, you're not going to do this on your own. You've got to get in a coaching program. Again, I know it sounds self-serving. That's the way you're going to rewire your brain. Thanks, Steve. All right, Lori, for you, I see a couple of questions in here from newer agents. What's the best advice for a new agent to convince clients to sign. So for agents that don't have the years of experience like you, what would you say to that? Well, you know, again, we're getting away from convincing. We're going toward a world of making people feel understood so that they value, trust, and want to work with you. So I didn't have years of experience when I first started either. I first started and my first buyers, I, I said, 
with a great quick beating heart and very red face. Luckily, they were just on the phone. You know, unfortunately, I'm I'm only able to work on an exclusive basis. So um, it's really about self-confidence and it's about standards and it's about knowing that that you can you can command whatever standard and fee you choose as long as you are providing that value to people which is that making them feel understood making them feel like you are their trusted advisor so I don't think there's any magic to it other than telling yourself you got this and that's your that's your standard and and that's what you're going to do it it um it can be done from the very beginning you just have to get away from your fear it does take that it takes the leap of faith that you can let people walk away that you can walk away from people who you feel are not going to respect what you have to offer and they're not going to commit to you so caroline read the question again no, oh, wait, I got to find it again. I'm going through lots of questions. So it was more so, um, hang on, hang on. What's the best advice for a new agent to convince new clients to sign the agreement? All right. This question, as a new agent, how do I convince new clients to work with me? This is what's wrong with the paradigm of real estate that you've all been programmed to believe. All of you, again, you've been taught, coached, that it's about your value. And the only way to have value is by having what? Experience, a track record, doing lots of deals. So as a new agent, how in the world could you ever compete? Well, the good news is this. It's not about value. It's about positioning yourself as a trusted advisor. And when you understand the difference, and this, again, this is what tactical empathy is all about. It's not about fact, logic, and reason. It's about emotion. You cannot overcome emotion with fact, logic, and reason. And the way to best position yourself as a trusted advisor is developing the skill to demonstrate you understand the circumstance and situation someone is going through and that you understand what they're thinking and feeling. And by demonstrating that understanding, by making people feel understood, that best positions you to be the favorite. So it's not about being a new agent. It's not about your track record. It's about your ability to make people feel understood. And with the right study, all of you are capable of doing that. All right, Lori, I got one more for you because I know we, we've we touched at this and th this question has come up um, a lot when we're doing these calls. And I know you do deal with some Zillow, maybe Street Easy leads every once in a while in the city. Um, how, any guidance on how you would handle prospects who call in on a listing, want to see it, but don't want to work with the buyer's agent? Or how do you handle these colder leads that are ready to go see a property? How do you introduce the agency agreement to them? Right. That's not something I, I do anymore. I, I did. Okay. I did that in the beginning. However, you know, as we talked about the process of this, the discussion about the document remains the same. You're going to get the recording. You're going to see me kind of talk through it tw two times. That's all there is to say about the agreement. What's going to get you there is that three-step framework that, that Steve presented, the concept of the favorite or the fool. And what I shared earlier on, which is, yes, if you feel because I know there are some requirements of, as to how you pursue a Zillow lead and what you need to do. If you need to go out and show that person this one property, then that is where you use the tool of the non-exclusive agreement and you get it administratively done. You you put that fee in there. You 
you put that property in there, you get it done. And over the course of that showing, you, you take the time, you find a time to get them on a Zoom call or after the showing or whatever it is to have that conversation and to get to the concept of the exclusive agreement. That's what I would do. I would say you should have a maximum of one freebie, one freebie being the non-exclusive. You take them out and then you talk about where you're going. So you're all going to hate my response to this, especially those of you that are working these type of leads. The first thing you have to look at is why are you working these type of leads? And that's something you really need to take a look at. The second thing is the way it looks like it's going in order to show property, you're going to have to have an agreement in hand. And having a non-exclusive agreement is not an agreement. Sorry. So all of you are going to have to come face to face with this. The way I would handle it would be, yes, I can absolutely show you that property. However, if you're not opposed, would it be a bad idea if we spent 10 minutes or less on a quick call or Zoom call discussing exactly what you're looking to do. And if they're not willing to spend 10 minutes on a call or a Zoom call with you, that's a very clear indication that you're probably the fool in the game and this is not a good use of your time, effort, and energy. Caroline? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. We're two minutes left. Lori, did you have some parting words and then we'll have Steve wrap us up? Um, my parting words, no, just thank you for, for your attention and your time. I know it's a big, big topic and there was a lot said and it's not all, it's not all going to be solved in, in one call, but you've got some resources now and I'll let it um, be wrapped up by Steve here. And Carolyn, why don't you put up Lori's page? The thing I want to say to all of you, this is definitely something that you need to address. This is not going away. And giving away your time, giving away your money, as Chris Foss loves to say, the more you give away for free, the more value you give away for free, the less valuable you become. That strategy is not going to work. So if any of you really want to work on your dial on your mindset mindset and dialogue around this agreement, you have an opportunity to work with Lori one on one. You can just go to performancecoaching.com, look up coaching and you'll get to Lori's page and she is available to coach you through this conversation specifically if that's something you want to do. Lori's put, put a, a tremendous amount of thought and effort into this, and she can guide you through the process. Caroline, any last words of? No, thank you both so much. Um, we are perfectly on time. Steve, I don't even know if we've ever done this. Lori, you're a miracle worker. Um, everybody that registered today, we're going to be getting a recording out to all of you with some other great resources. I'll get a coaching call that Steve referenced. Um, please reach out to support and performance coaching if you have any questions. And we'll definitely do another workshop like this in the future. So thank you, Lori. Thank you, Steve.